And we welcome you to this special edition of Night Shift here on the Black and Gold Banneret. Of course, you can check us out on this YouTube page. Make sure you like us and subscribe. I'm Eric Lopez alongside Bryce and Turner. This is more about a special edition because it's the UCF Hall of Fame. That's going to be the big subject on this episode. Of course, this Friday night, uh, the 2021 class will be inducted into the UCF Hall of Fame. They will also be honored during the football game on Saturday when UCF hosts East Carolina, a strong class. Of course, the Hall of Fame has existed since 1998. This is all brand new to Bryson. So coming up, we're going to talk about the five members in this class and their let, kind of their status in UCF history. I know Bryson's got questions on them. And then Bryson's got a long list, don't you, Bryson? You've got a long list of athletes, both from the past and even the present. So you're going to ask me whether you uh, they could be possibly future UCF Hall of Famers. Yes, sir, indeed. I'm very excited about this episode. He is really excited. He's been calling for this for a while. Uh, make sure you can drop your comments if you've got questions. Again, this is a Hall of Fame special. If you check out our previous episodes of Night Shift, uh, we did a recap of the UCF Navy football game on Saturday when the two of us were joined by uh, Drew Glukoff. Uh, of course, check out blackandgoldbanneret.com for all the latest in UCF as well as our podcast will be dropping later this week as we'll recap the Navy game and, of course, get you set for the ECU game and among all the other sports going on uh, as well. Uh, we also, on this YouTube page, by the way, we have an exclusive interviews with two of the five members of this Hall of Fame class, Natalie Land and uh, Afia Charles. We'll talk about it. Now, again, this Friday is the Hall of Fame uh, ceremony. The, the, the highlights, of course, this is a strong, strong class. That's highlighted by UCF football quarterback legend Blake Bortles. Blake Bortles is the headliner alongside basketball star Jermaine Taylor. And you got Josh Sitton, offensive lineman for UCF. And, of course, Natalie Land and Arfia Charles uh, is just class of 2021. Bryson, what's your reaction here as a newbie here on this class here with Blake Bortles, Josh Sitton, Jermaine Taylor, uh, Natalie Lane and a field Charles. Obviously, there's a lot of interest in this class. As I mentioned, the event is sold out. Uh, they've sold they sold the tables to the public this se- this year, and obviously, it's done very well if they're sold out. Uh, what what stands out to you? Well, I think a, the a big one is the fact that we actually have two football players in there from the 2013 um, from uh, one from the 2013 team, and then sitting from just before. I mean, I, for me, um, for someone that's you know that obvious follows you know the nfl the professional sports hall of fames like the mlb hall of fame and the nfl hall of fame you know um we we all talk about you know potential first ballot i think it's and i think it is well deserved well deserved as well uh for some for someone like me who was i'll date myself real quick i was born in 2000 so uh, so blake bortles was the only one of these athletes i was really able to watch in in person and he apps and he absolutely deserves this by all by all measures because that 2013 team led by him really put UC, UCF on the national stage. Of course, we had to go through some stuff before we would return again, but absolutely, but everything that Bortles did while he was here is definitely worthy of him being included in this in this pantheon of UCF athletics, his legends, basically. Um, I, as, after, as I've, you know, joined the banneret and have learned more about UCF history, uh, I, of course, uh, Afia Charles has really stuck out to me as well, especially since I've been so fascinated with Renaya Jones. And so learning about Afia and and, and what she is, she has done also is definitely definitely worth her inclusion in this in this as well, being the first night to be in the Olympics. So other than that, um, I don't really have much familiarity with the others. Uh, I do have a little story about Josh Sitton, though, that I that I will share once we get to him. But, um, but yeah, very enticing class, and I'm excited to learn about about the holes that I have in them. Let's talk about obviously this class now. Obviously, the I'm not going to go into all the requirements to get in. That might, we'll probably touch on that as this show goes on because there's a lot of complications with it. There's multiple ways you get in. You could get in. Obviously, first of all, if you're in if seven years after you got your degree or ten years uh, after you played at UCF, seven to ten year range. Uh, you're eligible. You can get in, obviously, based on your achievements at UCF, but there's also a way where a UCF athlete can get in if they had achievements outside of UCF. 
Uh, so that's kind of some of the particulars of the rule. But let's kind of start with some of the the, the, the current class here. And we'll start with Blake because I think Blake's – would you agree? I think Blake's the headliner here. He's probably going to be the one that speaks last, I would assume, uh, when they do the ceremony on Friday. He's the headliner. Would you not agree? Oh yes, I mean, just like any first ba- and just like any first ballot Hall of Famer is, he's very. I think he very much is the is the big headline and uh, big headline uh, headliner here. Um, I think the only other person that maybe we could probably consider as a possible one as well as Afia Charles, if only because she is the only so far the so far the only uh, UCF Olympian. So. I, I think that should pro- I think that should probably be under consideration as well. But Blake, I think, would be the one I would bet my money on. Yeah, let's get into Blake, and we'll go each person here. Blake, I think, obviously led UCF to the Fiesta Bowl. It was the number three overall draft pick in the 2013 draft. Uh, amazing career, and I think Bryson has become underrated. I think when we talk about the greatest quarterbacks in UCF history, Mackenzie Melton, who you know well, has come up a lot. Recently, with the recent with the success he had here, in particular in seventeen and eighteen, you have Dante Culpepper, well, obviously in ninety eight. I think Blake kind of gets lost in the in the shuffle there a little bit, uh, and I think that's unfair. I think he should be discussed more when you consider you know. And I mentioned this on the podcast when the Hall of Fame class was announced. You know, Blake led six fourth quarter comebacks during his UCF career. In comparison, Mackenzie Milton had one fourth quarter comeback. Uh, the guy was clutch, especially in that 2013. When you think of the comeback against Louisville, down 28 to seven, uh, down you know against South Florida at home, down against Temple, down against SMU, and then his performance in the Fiesta Bowl. To me, it's Milton, Bortles, Culpepper. Your superior. They're the top three quarterbacks. They're in tier one in UCF football history. But Blake's in that conversation, and you can make a case that he should be at the top. I don't know if he wins that argument over a Milton or Culpepper in the long run. I think he loot, but he should be in that conversation. Oh yes, indeed. But uh, Bort- looking at the record books right now, Bortle Bortles is somebody that I would also agree is underrated because he actually isn't because he actually isn't number w- number one in plenty of things, but he is in the top five, top ten in plenty as well. Although one stat that does really that does stick out to me is that Blake Bortles had two distinct uh, stretches without an interception that are in the top five of all time. He he had he went 232 at pass attempts without an interception from October 27, 2012 to September 14, 2013, and then he had 147 consecutive pass attempts without an interception from September 15, 2012 to October 20, 2012. So this is a this is a passer. That while I would say it isn't, it, it, I would say isn't really like, um, I guess the right way is that he's really good in one thing and maybe not as good as another thing. He was very, very consistent in most and most everything, and he's his name pops up everywhere in the uh, in of several places in the individual career record book. Um, record book. Oh, Eric, what would you say? Um, you mentioned all the comebacks that he did during the 2013 season, but if you had to pick to pick one from his career at UCF, which spans from 2011 to 2013, if I recall correctly, what is your favorite Blake Bortles moment? Because I have one that I want to talk about, but I wanted to ask you what yours was. Louisville game, 2013. The Louisville game in 2013 to 28 to seven, coming down from behind, leading that last minute drive. Going up against uh, uh, there, hitting Jeff Godfrey. Louisville, that was a you know Teddy Bridgewater led team. They were kind of everybody kind of foregone conclusion to be the American Conference champion. They're overwhelming favorite, and Blake was just uh, and that comeback was phenomenal. Uh, to me, that's his fa- my favorite game. Remember, keep in mind too, Bryson, about all those numbers you ran off. He split time in his 2011 season with Jeff Godfrey. He was not a full time starter till 2012. Uh, and of course, he he left early after 2013 because of the NFL prospects. He would end up being a uh, top three pick. So imagine if he starts, you know, more games, you know, than he actually did, and the numbers he could have put up. So people kind of forget that when they look at his numbers. He did it basically pl- platooning with Godfrey in 2011, and then two full seasons as a starter in 12 and 13, uh, and then he declared. So he didn't play his senior year in 14. 
That, that is a very good one. That is certainly one that I would consider for mine. But if I had, but honestly, for me, and I, I don't know if I, maybe I, maybe I misphrased moment because for me, I think there is one singular play that I will always remember Blake Bortles for at Bortles for and to really show the talent that he brought to the table. And that is in the 2013 Temple game. Now, people will always remember the the diving one-handed grab by JJ Wharton to get the touchdown. And that uh, and that obviously is b- very well deserved. Probably the play of JJ Wharton's life right there. But a lot of people might forget that Blake Bortles was nearly nearly sacked hard on that play. If you were if I if you remember Blake Bortles was out of was out of the pocket on that play and really had to find Wharton in order to get it off. And he was being, and he was basically made that throw as he was being sacked. I, I'm, I would pull up that um, if you have that video, it, it would be good to. Good to well, play. we're not allowed to show videos. I, I've learned right, that right, recently. Right. So but let, let's. Uh... But all right, got it. I, but because uh, really, the it, it's something that needs to be seen to be believed because that was because in my opinion, that was one of the be- one of the best throws that Bortles ever did. Yeah. As you see, as a UCF Knight, as, at least as far as from an athletic standpoint, and and the, just everything in that moment, I will. Ne- that is a, a play that will never make me forget Blake Bortles and for what he did in UCF, especially during that 2013 season. Yeah, I mean, you can follow those clips on YouTube uh, and Google it. Uh, we we're just not going to show videos here because I've learned recently that could get you in some trouble. <laughs> so we'll, uh, we want to we want to we want to keep it clean here. But uh, no, look, I think he was. And look, he got number highest draft pick in the history of UCF football. Number three over to Jacksonville. You know, lasted a while in the NFL. Uh, probably his career would be looked at differently if he wasn't the number three pick overall. If he was a third or fourth round, I think people say, wow, he had a nice career. But because he was a number three pick, uh, you know, people kind of look at it as a disappointment. But I think we've seen how the Jacksonville Jaguars operate. And uh, I think a lot of the blame for Blake's struggles turned to the Jaguars, in my opinion. But that's all other story. Hey, uh, hey, I mean, at least, hey, not everyone can say that they have a whole Twitter account dedicated to facts about them. And he was a little member. Remember, he was a game away from being in the Super Bowl, leading the Jaguars to the Super Bowl a couple, when they lost to New England. He played well in that game. So uh, certainly a fascinating career for Blake Bortles, certainly a legend, top three quarterback. I ranked him in the top five UCF athlete, male athletes of all time. Uh, and I think that's very fair. And so I, I have Blake there, uh, there as a top three quarterback of all time. It's all subjective, obviously. But uh, he was phenomenal, and I think, man, that 2013 season, Bryson, was a thrill ride. It's because uh, it, it, that was when UCF got to the Fiesta Bowl for the first time and beat Baylor. They were a huge underdog against Baylor, so uh, well deserved for Blake Bortles to get in there. Next guy I want to talk about, Jermaine Taylor. Ah, oh, Bryce, my opinion, the best UCF basketball player of all time. Top seven UCF athlete. I ranked them in my top. 100 UCF male athletes. You can Google that on blackandgobanneret.com. Unbelievable athlete. Dominated, can fly, put on a show. Maybe the best athlete I've ever seen UCF have in a basketball court. Had a cut some uh, a, a bit of a run in the NBA with the Sacramento Kings and the Rockets and so forth. Has played in the big three. But uh, JT, man, awesome player. I mean, people think of Bo Clark and JT. Uh, Jermaine Taylor is probably the two greatest, most recognizable basketball players. Certainly Taco Fall now has become recognizable with his success and B.J. Taylor. But as far as JT's the best individual basketball player they've ever had. I mean, the numbers he put up, Bryson, I'm sure you're looking at. Pretty insane what he did throughout his career. I wish he would have had uh, better teams around him. So he could have been, but he was the Conference USA Player of the Year in 09. Uh, He was a first-teamer, obviously. Uh, he averaged 26 points a game, which was third best in the nation, led Conference USA in scoring, uh, scored 812 points in that last season. It was just an incredible offensive player. Uh, he is the all-time leading scorer in UCF basketball in Division I era, and he only trails Bo Clark if you include the Division II basketball era for UCF. So uh, highest draft pick in UCF ba- uh, history in basketball with the 32nd pick. In the 09 draft by the Wizards, he was traded to the Rockets that night. Kind of interesting, Bryson. The highest football draft pick and the highest basketball UCF draft pick ever in the same class. 
Oh, yes. I think it really speaks to the level of talent that the UCF, UCF Athletics has been able to bring bring in ever, si- ever since they moved up to, Divi- to Division One. Now, obviously, Jermaine Taylor and Blake Bortles are both are in very different periods of time. But, I, yeah, I would say ever since UCF has, like, has gotten to Division One, they've been able to really bring in these generational talents. And now they're finally really getting their just due and getting inducted together, which I think is really great. Um, looking at um, one other stat about uh, Jermaine Taylor that, may, that you, you didn't really mention before, but I think is very interesting. Jermaine Taylor is second all-time in career three-point field goals, only trailing Matt Williams. That's incredible. And he developed that as his time went on at UCF. The interesting thing is, as you see, he wore number one. Well, B.J. Taylor wore number one. So I don't know if they retire a number one jersey. Maybe they just give him a a, a name with the jersey, kind of a ring of honor type of thing. I don't know what they're going to do. But, uh, man, he was an exciting basketball player to watch. And, uh, man, I think in in this era in the NBA, he would have fitted in nicely. I think he was kind of maybe a guy ahead of his time uh, when it comes to basketball his concern. And, uh, you know, he played obviously in the G league, uh, unbelievable, unbelievable basketball player. I think he would still be in the NBA if he was in today's game, which is a much more wide open game than it was when he was playing even about a decade ago. So what would you say is your favorite Jermaine Taylor memory? Just the highlights, man. He was the best dunker I ever saw at UCF. I remember a game against rice. He scored like 48 at home. Unfortunately it was a loss, but, just as just as explosiveness. I don't think it was a necessarily favorite game or moment. It's just the anticipation. Anytime he had the ball, something special was you felt like was going to happen. Something positive was going to happen. And I think that's the story with him was that's what he was able to pull off. And I was there, by the way, when he got drafted, uh, he held a part, a get together. In fact, I'm going to show you right there. You see that clip there's on YouTube with David Bauman, who at the time worked for Bright House Sports Network. Uh, he held, that was a party uh, in Tavares, which is his home. Uh, Jeff and I was there covering that. That was a cool moment. That's my favorite moment. I know it's not a basketball on the court moment, but to be there in that moment when he got drafted, not many people could say that. That was a cool moment that I won't forget. Excellent, excellent. I, I am, I am really glad you got to experience that with him. Uh, I, I experienced that with uh, Riley Green, who is on the Detroit Tigers right now, when he got drafted by them in 2019. So I can kind of, re- I can kind of relate to that. And there's really nothing like to, uh, nothing like it. Let's move to the next one. Uh, our members, Josh Sitton, uh, who just retired from the NFL. At a lengthy NFL career, was part of UCF's 2007 Conference USA Championship team, played in 50 games, 43 starts. He was first team call Conference USA in 07. Uh, of course, UCF, that was their first conference championship. Remember, that was the year Kevin Smith ran wild over 2,000 yards Was uh, that season. Well, there were uh, many of those times he was running be- behind uh, Mr. Josh Sitton, who started at both guard positions during his time at UCF, as well as at right tackle. Uh, was part of those two bowl teams for UCF, 05 and 07. That was the first two UCF bowl teams uh, there at the time. He was drafted in the fourth round of the 2008 draft uh, by the Green Bay Packers, a four-time Pro Bowler, which is tied with Asante Samuel, uh, Bryson, for the second most Pro Bowl appearances by a UCF alum behind only Brandon Marshall, six. Uh, Sitton was part of the Green Bay Super Bowl champion team when they beat the Pittsburgh Steelers and Aaron Rodgers and company. He played a couple seasons with the Bears. He ended up his career with the Dolphins. He was an all-pro first-teamer in 2014 as well as second-teamer in 2013 and 15 at the guard position. He is the only Knight, Bryson, to win a conference championship, start in a bowl game, and start in a Super Bowl and play in in a Pro Bowl. That is certainly that is certainly one one uh, oh man what word do I use I guess magnificent career I guess Play, I, yeah played eleven seasons in the NFL he announced his retirement back in April of 2019 uh, I had him ranked as the 12th greatest UCF male athlete on the top 100 male list there so yeah I mean it's it, sometimes it's really hard to talk about offensive linemen linemen because they don't really have statistics in the same way that other players do but 
I think honestly, if you just look at how long his career is, I think really kind of speaks for how good of an offensive lineman he is because not what an offensive lineman needs to do is basically protect is basically protect and be unmoving basically. And if you do that, then you're going to have a long, a very long career. And that's what Josh Sitton did. I mentioned earlier that I had a little bit of a Josh Sitton story and we mentioned the 26, the 2013 season. And one of, and I, and I had a great privilege of, of attending some of those games in 2013, thanks to my, thanks to my dad who had connections and he, and he's what, that was really the reason I kind of became a UCF fan in the first place after going to those games and really experiencing the bounce house. And through that, and, and during one of those games in 2013, I actually ended up meeting Josh Sitton when he, when he, when he was on a bye week, I believe from the Packers and he came to, came to the game and we, we and uh, my, my family heard that he was there. And so being an NFL player and me being like, you know, the oldest child who was like 12 years old at the time, obviously we, you know, we had to meet, had to meet him. And he, and obviously it was a short interaction because he was busy, but it was just really cool to be able to meet him. And he was a really nice guy from that interaction. So I'm, um, so not only was it great to meet, to meet him and now learn about him here, but also did, but also, you know, he came, he still, he came back to campus long before long before now and i have a, and i have a feeling he's still not going to be for, forgetting his ucf roots now or forever Pro- gets in with because of his nfl career some people have a problem they feel that this hall of fame should be just based on what you did at ucf and not necessarily after that your response are you what do you think bryson are you cool with some ucf guys getting in in part because of their pro career now i think Sitton was a great lineman so I think he has, you know, worthy consideration as a UCF. But clearly his NFL career pushed him over uh, there. Do you have a problem with that? Do you think it should be exclusive to what you did at UCF? Or do you are you good with the post-UCF career as being a part of the equation as well? Well, I mean, if um, one of the requirements is if you made it to the Olympics, so that I mean, which which usually can happen post UC, which good segue, mostly, mostly could which mostly could happen post UCF. So, I mean, if that's a requirement. Then, I mean, then I mean, I think post UCF uh, considerations is probably something that you want to do. Now, obviously, you shouldn't go willy nilly with it, but I think, but it, you know. If someone say had a bit of a average career at UCF and then then catapulted to start him in the pros, then I think that you kind of have to include them for the pro. But if say they had an average career in UCF, an average career in the pros, I mean you can make an argument for it. But I think that, uh, but I but I would take the first guy over the, over over the second one. So I think it just really de- uh, it really depends on the athlete, but. I think post UCF uh, inclusion should really only be served for someone that, you know, really nailed it, really nailed it in the pros. And in this case, Josh Sitton did just that. Well, and you mentioned Olympics. Uh, it was a good segue because our fourth member is Afia Charles Wilson, first track and field athlete ever to be inducted into the UCF Athletics Hall of Fame, first track Olympian in UCF Athletics history, belongs to Afia Charles Wilson, part of a great athletic family. Her, she's married to Torian Wilson, former offensive lineman for UCF, who was part of the 2013 Fiesta Bowl team. Uh, I actually talked to her at a one-on-one interview with her. You can check that out on our YouTube page. Subscribe to that. We'll hopefully also have an article uh, on the site, blackandgoldbanneret.com. But this was the one you're excited about, Bryce, because you've been into the track with Renaya Jones recently. But really, Renaya is kind of, while she's been successful, UCF's had a great legacy of track and field, and Afia Charles was a big part of that. Oh yes, indeed. I, I I think I think that you know being able to learn about Afia has been an absolute an absolute blast, and really shows that this UCF track team is honestly just on the on the rise again. Really, like it, it really. And looking at her, looking at the legacy that she left, she that she left behind. She still holds the record, the program record in the outdoor four hundred meters at fifty two point four nine. Uh, her uh, for nine. So the fact that her that record has managed to stand since twenty since twenty thirteen is certainly a testament to how good of an athlete she is and how good of an athlete will need to be if they want to break it. Now, Renaya, um, now I don't know if Renaya would compete in the four hundred meters meter sprint, but considering the uh, the athletes that coach head coach Dana Boone has, has been bringing in. I think maybe in the next few years we could possibly possibly see that and it see that happen and it really speaks to 
uh, Afia to really set that pre to, to set that precedent and be able to showcase re really be able to showcase how the standard really for UCF track and field athletes to in order to make it to the Hall of Fame. When I made my list about people to consider to go into the Hall of Fame, I looked at the previous Hall of Famers and saw where they are and re really use that as a comparison. So since Afia is the first track and field athlete to be in the UCF Hall of Fame. She really helps set that standard for every, every UCF track and field athlete going forward if they maybe have aspirations to be in there one day. You're muted, Eric. She's, she's incredible. I agree with you there. Uh, obviously, first Olympian represented the Antigua Barbuda in the 2012 London Olympics. Of course, her mom participated in the Olympics in 84 in Los Angeles. Uh, Part of that golden run at UCF from 2011 to 2014. She was an indoor 2011 All-American. She was an outdoor All-American on the relay in 2013, as well as on the four, uh, 2014 outdoor 4x400 relay. Uh, part of the conference outdoor, three outdoor CUSA championships 2011 to 2013, as well as two indoor CUSA championship teams from an 11 and 13. You know, that 2013 outdoor team, Bryce, and UCF finished fifth in the 2013 NCAA championships. And the Knights at that time became the first non-Power 5 program since 2000 to earn a top five finish in an NCAA outdoor championships. Charles was a member of that 4x100 relay squad on that team and set a new record in the preliminaries and finished runner-ups in those championships. We'll mention some of our teammates on that team because I have a feeling those names are going to come up when uh, you bring up some possible future hall of famers, but we're not, we're going to save that from when we go into that segment. But uh, you know, it's just kind of, a, it's maybe it's very fitting. Don't you think Bryson in a year that Rania Jones became a big story in UCF with her success, go, trying to qualify for the Olympics, finishing second in the NCAA championships, bringing notice to track and field at UCF in an Olympic year, it's fitting that UCF has an, a, a track and field athlete inducted to the Hall of Fame that was part of the Olympics. Oh, yes, indeed. I, I couldn't pick any better time to induct her into the Hall inductor. And honestly, at, at the stars just really aligned because, uh, because, of course, her career, if I remember right, lasted until 2014, right? So that means that – and so this year in 2021 – is that seven year wait, el, el, waiting period for eligibility. And so the fact that the time just coincided right uh, enough with the Olympics and the rise of Renia Jones, uh, it really, it all just really added up, which is funny because we wouldn't even be in this situation if the, if COVID never happened. So it's, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good point. So, it's, so yeah. I, so yeah, I mean, I said what I said before, I mean, uh, before Afia, really sets the standard for UCF track and field athletes of, that might want to get into the Hall of Fame. And we're considering that, you know, and considering Renaya, you know, I think that this, that she, her status as a Hall of Famer will really help maybe bring a little bit of comparison at least. And I think it'll be a very nice, um, I guess, uh, what's the word, goalpost for Renaya going forward as far as UCF athletes that track and field athlete legends that have preceded her. Final member of the class is Natalie Land. Softball played from 2009 to 2012. Uh, obviously, this is right up on my alley here. As the, I covered her. Best pure athlete UCF uh, softball's ever had on the field. Natalie Land was an all-state basketball player and softball player. In fact, when I interviewed her, she, it, a lot of people thought basketball was going to be the, the, the route she was going to go. Her uncle... Kerwin Bell was a legendary quarterback at Florida. A lot of people thought she would end up playing either basketball and or softball at Florida, which she grew up an hour away from in Mayo, Florida. But she ended up going to playing for Coach Gillespie at UCF, part of two NCAA tournament teams, the only UCF softball player to ever be a three-time first-team all-conference USA member. She ranks in the top ten in every offensive category. Awesome second baseman and shortstop, pure athlete, made highlight plays, that if Bryson, if we were, if those games were on ESPN Plus, like these games are now, she would have been on Sports Center often in the top ten place. That's how fantastic she was. Super happy for her that she gets inducted, rightfully so. True definition of what I think the UCF Athletics Hall of Fame is about, which is excel on the field, and she also excelled off the field at all academic. Uh, performer on you know she was you, you name the honors academically that a student athlete achieves for she got it 
Uh, so I'm super excited for her. Yeah, yes, same, same here. I, uh, I, I, for when I created my list, I and looked at softball athletes that haven't been inducted yet that I that we maybe could. I when I explored the record book, I saw Natalie Land's name pop up a lot. And honestly, if I had to make a comparison to another sport, I honestly think she's the Blake Bortles of softball because while she isn't the number one player in any of these offensive categories, she's in the top ten and practically all of them. Yep. So I so. I what so while she what she didn't excel in one specific thing that put her right on top, she she was managed to have such a high level of consistent success that we see her name everywhere. And when you see your name in the record book enough times, then you're gonna get into it a Hall of Fame. It's a good comparison. Very ironic. Same comparison. I would say I have her as probably the second best offensive player in the history of UCF softball behind Stephanie Best, who's in the Hall of Fame. This is the third UCF softball player, by the way, to be inducted. Uh, Stephanie Best in 2015, Allison Keim in 2019, now Natalie Lane in 2021. I think she's the second best offensive player of all time. I think Steph, who coached her for two seasons as an assistant coach, would be the first to tell you if you combine the overall package, what she did defensively in the infield, either when she was starting at second or when she was starting at short, alongside her offense, I think pound for pound, she's arguably the best infielder UCF has ever had. Steph was not the defensive player that Natalie was. Steph was a better offensive player, but Natalie was the better defensive player. She was a great offense player, different style than Stephanie. She played more, she was more of a gaps hitter, but she could pop one out of the park from time to time. And then obviously to me, she's a top five, at least at a minimum top five player in the history of UCF softball. So, and, you know, you look at the eras, Bryson, obviously I've, I'm part of it. To me, in UCF softball, when they started in 2002, you had, it was really, you could def- argue it's the, it was the Stephanie Best era from 02 to 05. If you just narrowed it down to one player, she was the best player during the A-Sun era. Then you had the Allison Kime era from 06 to 08. Then I think it was the Natalie Lan era from 2009 to 2012. And then you had Mackenzie Otis, Shelby Turnier, and then most recently, Aaliyah White. Those are the players that probably define those four or five year runs that UCF has had if you break it down to that way. So uh, super excited, very important recruit. As I talked to Natalie in the interview, really the first big recruit that UCF got over Florida at that time. That was significant as well. So uh, super happy that she gets in. Yeah, I would say that that thinking about the different eras, I would say Natalie Land in in, in the same way that uh, and again we're gonna go with the Blake the Bortles parallels again. I think that that that, that she and while she, she never got to experience the 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 highest that UCF softball would get to, considering the uh, you know coming into the age of Aaliyah White and the powerhouse of UCF softball is today. I think that her that her time here was a very important stepping stone that that poor program needed to take in order to get to that just like with Blake Bortles and how he was an important stepping stone for us to get to where the UC, where UCF football is now no doubt all right so that's the class of 2021 and where that we think they stand uh which was kind of cool to do now we're going to get to the part that Bryson's been uh, licking his chops for he <laughs> is going to run off a bunch of athletes from various sports that he will ask me about their consideration for the Hall of Fame. I have not seen this list on purpose because I want to be – I'm curious what he came up with. And we'll try to do this sport by sport to give you an idea what the future holds. Uh, we don't know – We we've heard speculation that this the Hall of Fame ceremony, which got moved to the fall this year, by the way, used to be in the spring the last few times, will now be uh, in the fall. They're going to try to do it annually. We'll see if that happens. I think that's good. I personally think they should do it annually. There's so many athletes now that should be get under consideration. Um, and I think that would be a that would help. Uh, and I'm guessing they're going to keep it in the fall. I think that's their plan to work it around a football weekend. So uh, we'll see how that goes. But without further ado, Bryson, the floor is yours. Where do we begin? All right, we're going to go ahead and start and start. I have all the record books for all the sports <laughs> lined up in tabs so that way I can I can make my, de- my make my defense for some of these guys if Eric decides see that they don't think And ladies. Right. So, we're going to start with so the first one we have is men's basketball. We have I, if I remember if I if I have my list right, I believe we have three names here. So, we're going to go and all of them are, and most of them are not yet eligible yet. 
but right. they will yeah. but they will but they will be be at, they will be within the next decade or so and decade or so so we're going to start with BJ Taylor who recently le- le- left this in two left in 2019 he's a, he is a, a, a obviously one of the leader leaders in several offensive categories he's only set he is tied with Bo Clark for career free throws and he's also in the top 5 for career three, three point field goal attempts and in the top 10 in career three point field goals BJ BJ Taylor what do you say Eric Absolutely he'll be in uh he'll be in not sure what year he'll be in but he'll be in I mean he's he's right up there as far as best point guards ever I mean he would probably be top 10 UCF basketball player of all time you could argue I know I think I ranked him in my top 15 I want to say when I did my list Absolutely. He, he's in. He'll be in. All right. Uh, one that I'm sure a lot of people will probably campaign for once his time comes, Taco Fall. Yeah. And, and easy sell. Uh, he might go in before BJ, even though they both graduated in the same year. I, I could see him going in before he does, but he, they're both going to be in. But yeah, absolutely. No brainer. He'll be oh, in. Yeah. He is the by far the leader in career blocks with 280 compared to Keith Clanton's 200. Keith Clanton's 220. Keith Clanton's probably, by the way, the next guy that should be in for basketball. Uh, he was a phenomenal player. When you look at the best big men that UCF's had, I mean, Keith was a phenomenal all-around player. Uh, better offensive player than Taco Taco, better defensive player. Keith Clanton would probably be the guy. And it's funny. we don't. One of the rules is there's kind of been, for a long time, you had to have your degree to get into the hall of fame, not necessarily the case anymore. I think, I think they may soften that as the years go on. We'll see. But I think Keith Clanton, who his last year, I believe was 2013 should be in soon. Uh, You could have argued that he would be in now. However, I do agree. Jermaine should got to get in before Keith does. But um, I think Keith Clanton is somebody you just mentioned there that also should be in. In fact, might be the next UCF basketball player that gets in within the next few years. What a coincidence. He was also on the list. So oh, yeah. Yeah. you basically beat me to the punch on that one. Way to go. Uh, I was also going to say that Taco Falls also third in career rebounds and holds the top and holds the top four season field goal percentage. So that's uh, another more case for him. Uh, one more basketball player to go. And that is Isaiah Sykes. Really underrated player. Uh, I don't, you know, that, he's a fascinating one. Uh, I would put him in. I think he will get in, but I think Keith Clanton will get in before he does first. And then, and you know this, Bryson, from being a sports fan, and I've tried to explain this on the podcast of things. A lot of this to, to, is also luck because it who's the competition within that class, you know, in that particular year? Who are you going up against to get votes? But I think Sykes does get in eventually, uh, but I'm not, you know, I, I, I'm more confident that Clayton will get in, Falls get in, and BJ will get in. I think Sykes should get in. He was a great all-around player. Didn't have a lot of support towards the end of his career as far as players around him and the success, team success. But I think he was a super talented player and should get strong consideration to be in. Oh, yes, for sure. He's in the, He is third place in, third place in career steals and holds plenty of and, – and his he is also uh, fifth in career assists. Just like, you know, several other names we brought up, you know, he's not number one in, in anything, but he's, his name pops up enough times in the record books that he, he can't not be considered. So that will do it for Let men. me give you a couple of quick names on men's basketball, and then we'll move on real quick. Josh right. Peppers, Dexter Lyons. They were part of the 05 uh, ASUN championship teams. I think they should get consideration too. Uh, I'm surprised they haven't been in. It's going to be a challenge to get them in. Because obviously, as we go through the years, there's going to be tougher, tougher uh, competition, uh, which is why I wouldn't be against if they expanded it to six athletes and stuff like that. But those are two other names I would also throw in there. But I'm not as confident if they will get in because, like, for example, they may have to go up against a Keith Clanton. They may have to go up against the B.J. Taylor, a Taco Fall. So, But I just wanted to throw those two names out because those are two guys that probably in that 05 run Maybe got a little overlooked here a little bit. But anyway, next sport. All right. So here we go. Baseball. Now, I'll be, uh, baseball. We don't, I don't have the, the, as many names on that. I have a, one, like one or two, one, two, three-ish. 
So first up, I'm going to throw you a curveball on this one. I've been waiting for you to get a reaction to this one. Okay. Vince Zawoski. Go ahead. Break it down. Played from 1985 to 1988. He, act- he actually leads. He actually played in 257 games, the most of any UCF player. He has the second most at-bats, but when you look at the runs that he's created, he is by far and away the has the most runs in UCF baseball history with 236 compared to the second place Tim Foskett with 190 with 196. Zawaski is also third place in hits, but first place in, with 285, but first place D Brown is 298. Second place of course is Tim is Tim Foskett by the way. Uh, Zawaski is also second in RBIs in all time, only eight behind D Brown at 229. D Brown would also be a name that I would consider as well. That well, probably. D Brown's in. D Brown got oh, his up in okay, 20. Yeah, that's what I thought. There was, that's what I thought. Okay. Uh, and uh, I thought, and then and Zawaski Foskett is also in the Hall of Fame. So. Exactly. And that's one of the reasons why that I really think Zawaski should be in because look at all these other baseball Hall of Famers that are already in and he's beaten them. In, or at least right in their neighborhood in some of these categories. Zawaski is also only three home runs away from leading, is, has 40 career home runs, th- three behind the two tied for the lead, Chris Duffy and Bobby Kisner, so, or Kaiser. So, at uh, Kaiser. So, I'm the fact that Zawaski appears in all, all, all over the top of these names, he has 195 career walks, he gets on base a lot. So uh, how come – so I w- I w- I'm amazed that it's been so long and Zawaski hasn't been inducted. Well, Do you agree with that? Uh, yeah. No, you know what? You made a great case. Uh, you should be on the uh, committee and make your cases. You, you've got a future in the attorney here. We've had this – I've had this argument with, uh, with Jeff because Jeff has been debating to putting Darren Slack and Mark Giacomi, you know, football players from the 80s. And I said – I think part of the problem, and I think this kind of qualifies here, when the Hall of Fame started, they kind of went every four years. And what happens is you're narrowing your list. And I think some of these guys, you know, you have people moving on from the committees. You have new people coming in. They don't know who you just mentioned. Like, I guarantee you, a lot of people that tune in have no idea who you just mentioned until now. I know about him. Uh, I think he's one of those. And there's a lot of UCF athletes. This is not going to be the last name we're going to bring up that has played at UCF in the 80s and the 90s that has been overlooked. And the question's going to be, how do they get in moving forward when the competition to get in is going to be much, much tougher? Uh, He would benefit if the Hall of Fame becomes an annual event and an annual year. And the other category I would add is UCF athletes that play during that time. Kind of like baseball. You're a baseball fan, Bryson. You know how they have the seniors uh, committee they kind of overlooks, looks back at some guys that maybe didn't make it the first time around. They look back to see and who gets in, like a Ted Simmons and things like that. Maybe we need to do that for the UCF Hall of Fame to get guys like him to get inducted. That's a very compelling case. I can't really argue with that. I think the reason why he wasn't in is because there wasn't a Hall of Fame really built at that time right away. And as time goes, some of these guys get lost in the uh, – gets lost. Yeah, I would say so. Foskett, for example, uh, he played from 1980 to 1983. He was an All-American at that time, and I do know this. If you were an All-American, that kind of gave you an edge. Uh, And and they they even mentioned that in their criteria. If you were an All-American, an all-conference performer, yada, 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 uh, that would get you in more likely. uh, in. So that's why Foskett, for example, is in, uh, as well as uh, a couple other guys. Here, here's a here's an interesting fact about Zawaski that I think would be that is actually very interesting. He he hit 20 triples, which is in a three way tie for the most all time in program history with Alex Morales and Chad Matala. How's that for a list? It's pretty good. A lot of Hall of Famers there. Tim Barker, another Hall of Famer. So, so all right. Uh, so there, so uh, wanted. To, how about a quick thing about D Brown or, or D? He D, got in. D, he D, got in. He's that. in. All right. So yeah. So, uh, unfortunately, you know, UCF baseball has kind of gone through a bit of hard times recently. So that's the only name from UCF baseball that I have on the list. So well, we, I, I would give you. Or, I mean, what other names do you have? Chris Duffy, Shane Brown. Duffy. Uh, they they've got good numbers. I think they should get consideration. Uh, and from that regard, the thing that hurt him is they didn't have a lot of team success there. Uh, Kyle Bono, great UCF pitcher during the A Sun run. Uh, I was under, I, I've heard that he was kind of in the mix this year. 
So it would not surprise me if he got in uh, from those A-Sun teams, championship teams. Uh, I think he'd be a great selection. How about a guy right now that we're watching in person is Dylan Moore, who's playing for the Seattle Mariners, had a nice career at UCF, kind of falls in that category, Bryce, and when his career ends, I think, with the Major League Baseball career and the career at UCF, kind of like Drew Butera, could end up down the road as a Hall of Famer. Uh, I, I think those are possibilities. There's a few other guys uh, that we kind of want to wait and see how they their careers play out. But, um, you know, baseball is a trickier sport from that standpoint because a lot of times people look at the team success and not the individual. But I think Shane Brown, Chris Duffy are two guys that I would look at if I was in the Hall of Fame there. Kyle Bono, for sure. Uh, I, I think back to the 2012 UCF teams and, and guys like Joe Rogers, who was a dominant closer to get consideration. It will be fascinating how the baseball guys get evaluated as time goes on. Because as you know, it's a tougher sport to evaluate because a lot of guys leave early to go to the MLB draft. So, you know, your, your, your numbers are not going to be eye popping if you only played, for example, for two to three years, right? Like a lot of the guys don't stick around for four years. So that's the, 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 the challenge. And it's going to be a challenge moving forward for a lot of other sports too as we have the transfer portal now as part of the mix. But I think baseball is the hardest to evaluate because like Chad Matola played a couple years, got drafted in, in the first round. It's the highest draft pick ever. So if you look at his numbers on the in the um, media guy, they don't jump out at you. But the guy is arguably the best baseball player ever at UCF and is now currently the hitting coach for the Tampa Bay Rays. So um, – Keep that in mind when you talk about baseball because the numbers don't tell all this, the whole story when it comes to baseball players. Oh, yeah, certainly. There certainly can be a discussion for how that works out. And I think once baseball season comes around, I think we'll probably end up having that. So next up, next up, I have three names in cross country, each of them a different designation. I have one from top, from UCF times gone by, a second one that's just waiting for, for her to become eligible, and the third one that is that is currently running right now. So we're going to start with the one from the, the one from UCF times gone by who actually left UCF the year I was born. So Sandra Shedden. Yes. Glad you mentioned her. Somebody mentioned me to her about her. She should be in again. Another example of a UCF athlete overlooked prop. I know she's been a finalist in the past. I think people have forgotten her because what happens is you have more recent success. You forget, and again, people change and all that. She should get consideration. And again, she would benefit if we did this event yearly and if we had an extra category where we can look back at maybe some UCF athletes, you know, from the past. I agree with you on that. And you're not the first to have brought her up recently. So good job by you on that. She run. She won all conference honors four times in the in the A Sun. I mean, I'm sorry, and she's the only. What years was she there? 1998 yeah. to, to two, and yeah. she also got it for 2001 as well. Yeah, she should so. be in. She's been overlooked. And again, another example of those athletes in that time period that has been overlooked, especially because they don't play in a mainstream sport. I think that's a valid point. I think that's a it's a it's something that hopefully maybe gets corrected down the road. I agree. Yeah, she is the only UCF cross-country athlete to ever do that. The only the, the one that came close, though, is the one that is waiting eligible. She was all-conference in the American three times. It's Anne-Marie Blaney. And if you're looking at the cross-country record book like I am, Anne-Marie's name is, is mixed up, I think, 75% of it. She's a lock. She's a lock. May end up being the first cross-country um hall of famer because she's probably what was her last year uh her last year i believe was 2016 so she could be coming up here soon and i know we're well, not to give away uh the our little secrets here but uh bryson and i might be uh are working on uh talking to her down the road here so but she's the greatest will get in could be in soon based on that which, but again, Bryson, there's an example. If she gets in, now that hurts, you know, Sonia Shitton. You know what I mean? She It hurts Sonia. And that's kind of the issue, especially when we run into these Olympic sports, is they're kind of going up against each other. It's unfortunate, but that's a fair. But I guess Blaney's a lot. Yeah, no well, I would personally argue that the, the fact that that Amor, that even Amory Blaney didn't get all conference on all, all conference honors four times, I think is certainly a case for Sonja. But, um, 
but yeah, but yeah, no, you couldn't agree. And she also has several records in the track and, and in the track and field record book as well. She yes. still holds the record for the mile, the three thousand meters, and five thousand indoor. She Should be in. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think Afia Charles getting in this year will open the floodgates for cross country and track and field, I think, moving forward. At least I, I would hope I would think so. All right. And now the all right. And then the last name on that I have on the list. And of course, you're free to add some names once we once we uh, are finished talking about this one. She is currently running right now. She is a freshman. Do you think that if Valerie Lastra keeps up the keeps up the performances that we've seen out of her, seen out of her, she's already run one of the top 10, 15 fastest six Ks in UCF history, and she's already a freshman. If she can keep this up, do you think that she could be inducted? One uh, inducted. Well, it's UCF? hard. I mean, she's just beginning, but certainly she's on the right track, right? I mean, she's being compared to Blaney already, so that's a good start. So maybe she could be from the present group would have a possibility, but it's so early. We got to see how this plays out. But yeah, I mean, I think she's one to follow and monitor from a cross country standpoint to see, cause she may be, I know some people think she has a shot to break some of those Blaney records. So we'll see. All right. And any other names that come off the top? Uh, of not for cross country. I think you nailed it pretty good. I think that's, that's really good. All right. Let's go ahead and get and do football. This is going to be oh, fun. Boy. All right, so well, some people would say there's already so much football in. That's part of the That's issue true. with the other sports. That I is mean, very true. Almost every class has at least two football players getting in. But go ahead. I, so I, we're going to go ahead mean. and so all right. So I we're probably going to just go, we're probably going to scan through this a lot of yes and nos because I do want to get into the other sports. Oh yes, for but, sure. But, I agree. But, yeah. I agree. Yes. So and we'll t and we'll kind of maybe go a little deeper on some highlights. So first off, I have the ones that are already eligible. They could be inducted today. So we have. Uh, Bruce Miller. Off-field issues with him. Okay. Uh, I He's got some off-field issues he's had in his recent years. I don't know how he's doing now. Hopefully he's doing okay. If it was just on the field, uh, he would be in. But he's had some off-field issues, and that is something that is frowned upon uh, by a committee. I know that, and, you know, I don't, I, underst I completely understand that. So it, it, that's a tricky one. That's a very tricky one. I don't really want to say more about it because I don't know where he stands right now with his off the field issues. I know he recently came back with the Jaguars about a year ago. Hopefully all those issues he had was behind him, but I don't know what's going to happen there. Remember we've had uh, one of the popular topics over the years is the late great Gene McDowell has not been in because he was part of this felony case for the cell phone scandal back for UCF football uh, back in those days that ousted Gene. There've been a lot of people behind the scenes trying to get Gene in I personally think Gene should be in, but the reason he's not in is one of the uh, 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 details of the Hall of Fame is if you have a felony in your records, you're not eligible for the Hall of Fame. And right. so while this is not a felony that you would think of as a serious felony, nonetheless, it is a, he does have that in his record. So um, I'm not saying that that's what Bruce has, but I do know that Bruce is off-field issues. You, know, you can Google that. Uh, is would be the reason why it would keep him out if he does stay out. I don't know what's going to happen there, Bryce. And that's one that we'll have to go year by year and where everybody stands at that. All right. Well, let's go ahead and keep going. Uh, he's playing in the NFL right now. Um, he used to have the longest field goal in NFL history, Matt Prater. Well, he gets in. He's going to get in for his pro career. He wasn't a great kicker at UCF. Everybody remembers he missed the extra point in a Hawaii Bowl. They lost the game against Nevada. He missed an extra point in overtime in a homecoming game in 04. Uh, but yet he had a great NFL career. So I think he will get in. I'm not a big, you know, I think he's going to get in based on his NFL career. Whenever right. he went 10 years after he retires. All right. Mike Sims Walker. Ooh. So the argument there is he had a better college career than Brandon. They played together. Uh, so you could make the case that he could get in. However, his NFL career was not as nowhere near as good as Brandon, and that's why Brandon got in. So he's on the bubble. Uh, he's a bubble guy. I could see it go either way on that. I watched him in person. I would have no issues if he got in, but I understand why he's not in as of now. Will he get in? Remains to be seen. All right. Here, here, Here's one for you. So David, you we know we know David Rhodes is a currently a member of the Hall of Fame. Yep. But do you know 
who the, who is actually in second place behind him for the most receiving yards in in UCF football history. Is it Traquan? No, it's not. Who he played it? from 1995 to 1998. It's Mark Nonsend. Yeah, you know, I'm like, you know, I ranked him in my top 100, but he's not in. Neither is Sia Burley from that era. And I think those guys get punished because Dante Culpepper was their quarterback, but somebody had to catch the football. Um, so the I personally am a Burley fan. Uh, it is interesting that neither of those two get in. I think part of it was because they were an independent. They didn't really receive a lot of national recognition, and I think that hurt them. So it's gonna. I'll be honest with you. It's going to be hard for them to get in because look at the wide receivers that are about to come, that are about to become eligible at UCF, that have a better resume. They they're gonna have a challenge. They're gonna have a hard time getting in. All right, next. All right, next up on the list, another '90s football player, Darren Henshaw. He was on the staff right now at UCF. Yep. Uh, he, just, and just so you know, he actually held the uh, held the passing yards per complete uh, per completion career record uh, record. Dylan Gabriel is the one that beat him in that one. He's another one that I think if Jeff was here would tell you that he should be in. And I will say the same thing. The problem that him and Darren Slack and Mark Giacomi are going to have is you're going up against better guys moving forward. Uh, so it's going to be a challenge for him to get in. But I, I, I think he should be in. I think he should be in. He was a great quarterback at his, at the, at his time. Kind of lost in the shuffle. Again, he would fit nicely in this category where you look back at some of those UCF players from that era as a category. Uh, but we'll see. I don't know, man. I don't know if he gets in. If, 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 if it... If we keep it, if if the rules stay how it is right now, I think it's going to be hard for him to get in. But he is on the staff currently at UCF, so you never know. All right, here is here. All right, here's one very underrated, very underrated quarterback. And I would say that even if he doesn't make UCF's Mount Rushmore quarterbacks, I would say that he's probably in in fifth place. Jeff Godfrey. I don't think so. Uh, changed positions. Was a great athlete, but. Think about it. this is a hard sport to get in because there's so many talented athletes and players that have had great UCF careers and NFL careers. I don't see Jeff getting in because he wasn't like it wasn't like he was a standout guy. Like there was a ton of talented receivers in that core that he was part of. I don't think he gets in uh, because there's just so many UCF football players, so many that are going to get in or should get or get consideration to get in that it's going to be hard for him to crack that list. And, all right. Speaking of that, here are the here are some recently eligible football players. There are three names that are just re, that just recently became eligible in the last couple of years, and a couple of years. So first off, Latavius Murray. He will get in. Uh, I would make this rule, by the way, if I'm UCF. I would wait till the player is retired from their professional league. Uh, you know, I was kind of bummed out when I was at the 2019 class. Drew Butera got inducted in the spring of Hall of Fame 2019, but he could not attend because he was with the, I think it's the Philadelphia Phillies at the time. So he couldn't attend. So his dad was there in his place. So for I would not want Latavius to get inducted while he's still playing because he's not going to be able to come more than likely. But he's going to get it. All right. Quincy McDuffie. Again, this is going to be a hard categories to get in to stand out um certainly should be mentioned i don't think he gets in all right clayton gathers should get consideration underrated safety he's had a nice career in the nfl has been uh, bank dealing with some injuries i'm curious if this committee will show respect to defensive players as far as getting into the hall of fame i always feel like the offensive guys get a lot of the benefit of the doubt Asante Samuel is the most recent defensive player to get inducted uh, in 2015. I, I think Gethers will get consideration. I could see that going either way. Uh, I think he gets in, but it might be a while. All right. Maybe. Uh, do you have any other defensive players that you maybe you'd like to see get in? Oh, wow. Well, the Griffin boys are going to get in. The Griffin boys should get in. All right. Um. The real controversial one is do you put in someone like Mike Hughes who was here for one year and made a huge impact? I don't know. A lot of people, I think, would have frowned on that. So I don't think he gets in from a defensive standpoint. Um, but, yeah, the Griffin brothers stand out. Terrence Plummer, linebacker, UCF Fiesta Bowl, 
I think should be the next guy to get in from a defensive standpoint. We'll see if he does. Um, AJ Bouye might get in. He's had a really good NFL career. So I think he's a name to watch. Um, I'm good for now for that. All right. All right, now we're into the not yet eligible ones. These are from the more the the more recent the more recent teams. And if they are from the 2013 team, then they probably then they stuck around for a, a little bit after that. So first off, we're gonna start. I, first off, uh, I think these are gonna be obvious. Mackenzie Milton. Oh yeah, he'll be in. All right, not said. Uh, running the running back duo of Greg McRae and Adrian Killens. Ooh, I don't know. Uh, that's tough. So Killings, that's a tough one because how do you separate them? You have Otis Anderson in that mix. Like which one really stood out? Killings was probably the more popular guy. I don't know. I, I don't know about that one. I don't know if they get in. Well, I would, I, I think I'll say this. I think they're all going to get in. I'll say this. They all get in. Cause I do think the 2017 football team will get in at some point. They have inducted teams before the cheerleading national championship team, the 1978 volleyball team. I think the 2017 football team will get inducted. So as a result of that, a lot of these guys like McCrae's and Killings and Borderlines will basically get in through that. But I don't know if they get in individually. All right. Uh, the entire 2017 team actually was on my list, by the way. And, cons- and on the topic yeah, of and on the topic of entire teams, considering this team has had so many successful players on it, do you think the 2013 team might get in? I would be for it. Their criteria is if you win a national championship. That's fair. I don't know if I agree with that criteria, but if they stick to that, probably not. But I would give that team consideration for sure. All right. So individual. Now, all right. Now we're back to individuals. Traquan Smith. In. Should be in. I think he's the best UCF wide receiver that I've seen in person. And that's saying a lot. I've seen Marshall. I've seen Sims Walker. Uh, I think Traquan's the best. Hasn't had the NFL career yet, but I think he should be in. Yes. All right. Uh, we'll stick with wide receivers. Gabriel Davis. Well, if he continues to have a nice NFL career, he'll get in. And probably rightfully so. Uh, him like Traquan. I think those two. I like those two better than Killings and McCray getting in. All right. Uh, one more name from, from the uh, the graduated but not yet eligible. The all-time leading scorer for UCF, Matthew Wright. Well, he's playing in the NFL. If he could have a nice NFL career, that will help. Um. We'll see. Kickers are tricky to kind of handicap on that. All right, one more football name for this, and I think a lot of people will. Pro- a lot of people might w- will be curious to to see if maybe he could get inducted one day, if especially if he comes back with a vengeance. Dylan Gabriel. We got to see how this ends, right? It's like that movie that has does. We don't know the end to that. We'll see. It depends how his career ends. He certainly made he's he certainly made his name uh, his name prominent in UCF record books already. That's for sure. Right, but but I think you nailed it though. We got to see how this ends before All we right. can evaluate that. So that'll do for foot. That'll do for football. Now we're yeah, gonna- other guys, real quick. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a couple of names to consider. Alex Haynes was a running back in 2000, 2001. I think he'll get consideration moving forward uh, from the older era there, um, from an offensive standpoint. Uh, so. You know, we'll leave it as that because I want to go through the other sports. So for those that are going to comment, what about so-and-so? What about so-and-so? You're probably right. Football's got a long list. We'll see what happens. But I think the names we've addressed are probably ones to keep to remember to keep an eye on here moving forward uh, in future classes. All right. Next up, golf, both men's and women's. We're going right. to start – we'll go ahead and start with the men, with the men's first. Uh, we're Greg Eason. He has the most career vic- individual vic- individual victory victories yep. for UCF, yep. and it also leads career scoring out. Yeah, I think he should be in. I think he should be in. Yes, uh, golf is, it, and it'll be interesting how they handle that. I don't think they've had a golfer in the class since Robert Dameron, but yeah, I think Greg Eason should get consideration. Uh, yeah, and that's another reason why I, I I put him on the list was because he is the only UCF Knight that has more career victories than Robert Dameron. Yeah. So, so I think that's certainly. So I think that certainly is something to consider there. Uh, he's the only men, uh, men I have right. Uh, man, man golfer I have right. Now. I will say Ricardo Guvia participated in the Olympics. I believe was a teammate with Greg Eason. Had a good couple years at UCF. Is currently playing in the European Tour. Uh, 
not necessarily the pro league. I think he's down in the uh, trying to get back to the pro league, but he was in the Olympics uh, in Rio. Should get some consideration as well is Ricardo, uh, Ricardo Gouveia. I, that would be the other men's golfer I would mention that maybe stands out uh, at this time. All right. Now I have two women's golfers, one okay. from time gone, one from times gone by and one from a little more recently. So sure. first, so first up, we have the by the far and away career victories leader, Kristen Putnam, who played from 1993 to overlooked. Great choice, Bryson. She's overlooked again, falls under the, the, the victim of being somebody that was here back then. And it's hard to keep track of stats and people now here don't know her and stuff. That's a valid one. Uh, I had her ranked in my top 80 UCF female athletes of all time. Very much overlooked. All right. And then we'll, and then one more name. She is not yet eligible, but her. I'll uh, give you another name from that era. Liz Early, who had Liz, a cup of coffee oh, yeah, in the I, LPGA. Five. Yes, that. Yes, he, she's right behind there. So, yeah. I early. ranked her in the top 30 in my uh, rankings list. All right. One more name. One more name. She's a little more recent. Um, Her name appears and uh, she is second in single season average. And she did have the lowest 54 total, total in night history until today when Tenrata Pitt and beat it, Elizabeth Moon. Oh, okay. You caught me there. Uh, Elizabeth Moon also is also tied for the lowest 18 hole record as well. She's good, but to me, the one that's going to get in before her should get in before her because I think she's the best UCF golfer ever is Ashley Holder. I'm surprised you did not mention Ashley Holder, who is a three-time All-American honorable mention in 14, 15, and 17, three-time American golfer of the year, 14, 15, 17, was an American Conference freshman of the year in 14. Uh, she helped UCF win the American in 15 and 17, make the NCAAs three times. She won the individual in the American Conference Championship in 17. She's participated. She should be in. She All is right. arguably the best one if you just include UCF careers. I think she's better than Moon, and I think she gets in before Moon does. Fair enough. I looked a little bit at, a little bit too much at the stats on that one. Holder is the is act is the third is the third career. UCF women's golfer to achieve a career individual victory. She was just recently joined by Ten Tenrata Pitten today. Congratulations to her. I'll talk about her on Nightcap and probably gush about her as well because um, right. my family is a big golf family. We love this sport. So there you go. that'll certainly be something going forward. All right. So next up, next sport, uh, we got one rower on here. Uh, on here, Lauren, or, or two rowers, I'm sorry. Lauren Aiello. Uh, Aiello. I can't pronounce it. I'm sorry. Well, uh, may name the other one. Name the other one. Christina Sarf, right? It's the other one you yes, have? Christ yes, Christina Sarf. Uh, Sarf should be the first rower to be an individual rower. She was the first All-American ever. She was part of the first UCF rowing team to make the NCAA tournament, I believe, in 07, I want to say. Uh, sources have told me she was in the mix this year. She was a finalist this year. So I think her time is coming. I think she gets the she gets the first choice. She gets the She becomes the first rower of the two. So if you ask me, and rowing is a tough sport to just get a bunch of people in because it's a weird sport to, to kind of evaluate and things like that. I think of those two, Sarf gets in. Here's another name. Uh, now, if I remember right, is uh, Chelsea Lazan in already? No. No? Oh, yeah. No, she's not yet eligible. She actually – she only just became eligible recently. She graduated in 2000. Right. She, her last year was in 2012. But I think Sarf – until the all-region first team yeah. four times. I think Sarf's got to break the break the window. You know what I mean? Break that glass ceiling, kind of like a track. Once the first one gets in, then there's a better chance for the rest. I think Sarf's the first rower. All right. Ne next up, we have men. We have soccer. We're gonna start with the men. So first up is uh, is a player that's played from way. I've, we talked about the '80s, but this is from the early '80s. Yeah. We have Rick Brotensevic. Great choice. I'm shocked that he's not in the Hall of Fame with the great history of UCF men's soccer. He followed Winston DeBose. He played in the pros back then with the Rowdies, did Rick Brentsevic. He should be in. He got overlooked here. He so, got lost. Now, here, here's the interesting thing is that he actually leads UCF in career saves. Yeah. He has 444 saves. Yeah. Second place, 379. How do you yeah. not induct that? I, uh, and people miss because people don't know they don't follow their history and again back UCF started the Hall of Fame was every four years only five members two of them are usually football 
So you're not you only have room for maybe one or two spots every year. But you're right, he's been he's been missed overlooked. Absolutely. Agree 100%. All right. We got three names that are very re- that are very recent. So yep. recent so it'll sure. be a while before they're up. Uh first up Cal Jennings. Absolutely. Lot. Best goal striker I've ever seen in UCF soccer on the pitch. I will never forget his what his last kick at home. Uh goal at overtime to beat uh, to send UCF to the Sweet 16 in 2019. I had the privilege to call that uh, to beat Missouri State. First time in men's soccer history they got to the Sweet 16. Best pure goal scorer in this era. Absolutely. Should be it. Will be it. All right. Next up, it, ne- next up Yannick Ertl. Absolutely. Will be in. In my opinion, only behind Winston DeBose as the second greatest goalkeeper. You, I think he's surpassed Rick Bredcevic. With his last year, what he, what he, the great performance he did, absolutely, he should be in. All right, and then I went ahead and found a little bit of an under, uh, an under, an underrated one, y- Yanni Sorokin. That's a harder one uh, for him. I don't know if he gets in over a guys like Jennings and Ertl, and we haven't even mentioned guys like Sean Johnson, who is playing for Team U at the, the in the career. MLS, the pro career. Great pro career. Could get in based on his pro career. He was only here at UCF for two seasons, but has had a great international career and a pro career uh, in the MLS and, of course, with Team USA. He's a name to follow. Warren Cravel is playing in the MLS. Had an, was an All-American at UCF. We had him on the podcast recently. He's another name to get consideration. Uh, oh, here's one uh, Here's one that's not that I don't think is eligible yet because I have some stuff from 2015 on him. Aji Barry. Aji Barry. That's a harder one. I don't think he should get in over a Warren Cravel, for example. Uh, so that's a trickier one, or a guy like you know. But that uh, he'll get some consideration, but not. It, it, I, I wouldn't. I, I would say right now, no, no. All right. I don't think he gets. And we that. have one active men's soccer. So do you, so. I want you to evaluate his potential on this one. Sure. Uh, Luca Dorado. Ooh, too soon, too early to tell. Uh, but he's on a good. He's having a great year. Uh, so we'll see. Uh, we'll see. That's, uh, again, there's so many guys, again, there's so only so many spots that it, you got to see how this career plays out. That's a harder one to kind of, I want to see more. I need to see more. All right. I have a couple, I have, I believe two names from women's soccer, because I mean, when you're playing in the same sport as Michelle Akers, it's a, definitely a, a hard right. act to follow. First up, it's, it's a, it's a goal. It's a goalkeeper from times gone by. Uh, Alyssa O'Brien should get consideration. What's tricky there is Alini Reyes was the most recent one to get inducted. Uh, man, UCF's got a lot of great goalies. Her and Met Jennifer Manis. I don't know if they get in. I don't know. And you mentioned it. It's hard in women's soccer because there's some actual uh, players here coming up here that probably will get consideration to get in. Well, here's my argument for Alyssa O'Brien. I think that that I think is the big thing. She has. She was only a half game, a game, a half away from tying Karen Richter in shutouts. She's second, only a half behind her. She also has the most saves in in, in UCF pro, pro, program history. She has 424. Reyes, 347. Blown her out of the water. I. I, would, I wouldn't I be would, against it. I wouldn't be against it. I'm just saying, if the, she hasn't gotten in by this point, it could get harder. But I, I wouldn't be against it. All right, and now we're gonna move. And now we're gonna now. Here's a, a woman. That, now here's a woman that's playing today that I think could, could that could possibly have a chance at it. Uh, at it, I would say, and Caroline Delisle. Yeah, the track that she's going, she'll get in for sure. If she continues the track that she's going, she'll get it. Yes. All right. Uh, who would you say are any other names that come to mind for you? Tisha Jewell. Tisha Jewell should get consideration. I thought she might have had a shot for this year. Or maybe in the next couple of years, I think Tisha Joel, uh, Trisha Joel should get in and get consideration uh, on the women's side there. Uh, you know, and then it gets tricky there. You know, I mean, there's a lot of standout players of Morgan Ferrer, but she wasn't there a long time. Kayla Adamick, uh, Marissa Jones. Diggs. Say who? Amy Jones, 90s. Amy Jones had a great career, kind of has been overlooked part of that 90s era. There was kind of the, the lost time because UCF was kind of transitioning from conference to conference uh tricky it's tricky on that one because the standards for women's soccer are very high uh but i think if i had a bet i would say trisha jewel should probably be the next one 
but you make a compelling case for O'Brien and you make a case for Jones as well. Uh, there's players like Marissa Diggs as well, defensive player uh, that we, you know, will they get the respect? Time will tell. All right. Now here's one more from women's soccer because and women's soccer I want to save this one for last because she should be eligible and uh, eligible in maybe a year or two. Amanda, uh, Amanda Cromwell, because there's a difference yes. in qualification for coaches. I was told that in 2019, she was in the mix to possibly get in. Uh, I don't think she, now the problem is she's coaching still at UCLA. Uh, so she would not be able to attend, even if she were to get inducted in the fall, they should wait. But absolutely, absolutely. Whenever she retires, she should be inducted. Absolutely. All right. All right. Here, now, here, here we go. This one's for you. This one's for you, Eric. It's softball time. Oh, here we go. Put me on the spot. Go ahead. All right. First off, the from already eligible, she was she finished playing in 2009. She's one of the best fielders that fielders the team has ever had. Looking at the stats, I want to see if you can guess who it is. Brian Javier. You got it right on the head. Yeah, you know, I think she should get consideration. Played a year in the pros with the pride. The thing that hurts the softball players, the pro leagues have been, uh, you know, it just hasn't been successful as far as a league being successful. Uh, the thing that hurts her is she's not doesn't have numbers that stands out power wise. I think she should get in, but just like some of the other athletes we've mentioned during this, they get overlooked. Like she was in that same time frame as Allison Kime. Kime just got in in nineteen. Now Brianne's going up against the Natalie Lands and the and the other players. That's going to be harder for her to get in. If it was me, I would get her in, but I don't know if she does get in. Uh, that remains to be seen. Her and Janae Shinhoster are kind of in the same spot. They were kind of overshadowed by a Hall of Famer on the same team, and the committee picked one, and they don't go back to pick a second one. Will they do that moving forward down the road? I don't know. We'll see. Oh, here uh, to, to just put in perspective how good of a fielder Brianna Brianna Javier was. Uh, she leads in, in the chances stat. She has two thousand six hundred sixty-seven chances. The, the next closest one is Samantha McCloskey with fourteen fifty. Yeah. yeah, best field, okay. best fielding first baseman I've ever seen. Uh, reminds me a lot of Don Mattingly, baseball player reference there. Um, yeah, no, look, I mean, you won't get an argument for me. I just don't know if the committee will put her in. Uh, I would put her in, but I don't know if the committee will. All right, here's someone who just became recently eligible, Tiffany Lane. Again, you can make the make case she's hit one of the most significant home runs in the program history when she hit the two-run homer in the 08 USA Championship game over uh, Houston, which was a top-10 team. They won 4-2. Uh, I don't know what her academic standing was at the end, but let's just say it's good. Uh, borderline. Again, does the committee put her in? Does the committee recognize players that don't have standout offensive numbers, even though she does? I well, think she should get she consideration. More, well, she it, has more runs than Natalie Land. She does. She, she does. Also, she also has over 10 triples more than the second most, who is Stephanie Best. Tremendous. She should definitely get consideration. Uh, we'll see because the competition is going to get harder as the years go by. We'll see because – uh, it remains to be seen because as we're going to mention some other names that are definitely going to get in, those are some of the athletes Tiffany may have to go up to. But I appreciate you uh, having their backs. So I'm all for it. I'm not going to argue with you on that. All right. And now next up, we have a few. Uh, um, we don't. I don't have anyone from the current team right now because obviously they're not playing right now. Fair. I fair. do have three recently departed uh, softball players that are not eligible yet, but uh, but will uh, but obviously will become eligible at some point in the near future because obviously UCF softball has been really great the past several several years. So first up, Shelby Turnier. Absolutely, Locke, the most decorated player in the history of the program. She will be in the minute she's eligible. Absolutely. Next up, first McKen All American ever. Next up, Mackenzie Otis. Should be in. Should be a lock. I actually would vote. I would actually like to see her and Shelby get in in the same class because they were the shake and bake. That was their nickname. They were the one-two punch in the 2015 team. They should be in together, but they both should be in. They're definitely locks. They're both top five all-time UCF players, without question. All right. And then, of course, we just – and then, of course, we had to say goodbye to her this offseason. I think you know who I'm going to talk about here. Aaliyah yep. White. In should be a lock when she gets in, uh, eligible. She should be a lock as well. I will give you two more names. Kaylee Novak, who her dad was the pitcher at UCF, Tommy Novak. I think both of those people should be considered. How about that? Wouldn't that be cool, Bryson, if you can induct Kaylee Novak, 
And her dad, Tommy, who was a two-year pitcher, the ace in the mid-80s, beat Florida. Uh, I think they both should get consideration, I and I think both should be in, especially Kaylee. Kaylee was an amazing infielder, very similar to Natalie Land. And then Ferris Sullivan would be the third baseman. Another name I would throw as a consideration was a player of the year, 2014. I'm not even going to ask bring, bring up Linnea Goodman who certainly has great numbers and played in the Swedish national team as well. There's a few others, but uh, I did want to bring up the Novaks because I think that would be kind of cool to have a father and a daughter in a, in a class, wouldn't it? Oh, yes, I would agree with that. And I think if UC, the UCF Hall of Fame becomes a, an annual thing, I think that they're, that's certainly something that, helps. It helps. They would, that they would do. And I think that it, it, it could make the class stand out really, it, really well. It would certainly be one of the biggest stories of the class, that's for sure. I, I would say so. Uh, all right. So that is softball. We're now going to move on to tennis. We get to right, tennis. We're going to go faster on this because we got to wrap this up here soon. So that we do. To... So first up, Brock Sakay. I don't think so. All right. Don't think right. so. Because I think Adeline... you're going to tough sport to get in. Adeline Bradu. Tough one. I don't know if she gets in either. I think you're going to see. I don't think you're going to see a tennis player get in until this current run that we're currently under right now. Go ahead to the current, the ones we just saw in the last year or two. I don't think you're going to see it until they become eligible. Speaking of this current run, Gabe DeCamps. Yes. That's, he might be the next men's tennis player. He might be the men's tennis player that gets inducted. The, 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 the. All right. Any other men's tennis players you'd like to bring up? Let's see what happens with Hildebrand this upcoming year. He's one to follow on the current team. Um, but I would say to camps and then on the women's side, there's a couple, I think Rebecca Stomar might get consideration down the road. And, um, the other one from the, this past year's team that was ranked singles, uh, will also get in as well as consideration. Uh, but you know, I, I think those are the ones you're going to look at as far as that's concerned. All right. Next up, we got three names in women's tennis. None of them are eligible yet. But uh, they should be, but often they will be soon. First up, uh, Monica Matthias. Borderline, we'll see. Who are the other two? Na Natalia Serrano. We'll see. Who's the third one? Current current, uh, current player, Valeria Zaleva. That's the one. Thank you. He, She will get in. I think she will get in. I think Stomar has a chance to get in. Probably, I would. I think those two that I just mentioned have a better chance than the other three you mentioned, although Monica has a shot as well. All right, next. All right, next up, track and field. Uh, the, the, we're, we're, we are so well, Thea Charles just got in, and you said yeah. with her, the floodgates are now open. It should, it should, and, and it should. So these and so these and so these three women just recently became eligible along with Thea, Jackie Coward, Sharia Scott, and Jen should Clayton. Be. So, and you didn't mention Octavius Freeman. Oh no, she's in there. Oh no, she's in there. She just is. Um. Oh no. Oh no. Wait. Yeah, she is eligible. I don't know why she's there. Octavius Freeman is one of them. Yeah, I had her Freeman, in the category. Oh, no. Freeman, Freeman, Scott, and uh, Freeman, Scott, Coward should be in. Should be in. All right. Over Clayton. Clayton was more of a relay person. I'm not saying she shouldn't get in, but I think if we got to rank them, I think Scott, who won a national championship, although I do know she had some off field issues. Um, hopefully that's behind her. I think Scott, Coward, Freeman, in whatever order you want to put them, those three need to be in within the next 10 years or so. Do you have any – now, these are all obviously track people. Do you have any field events do you think we could maybe see someone in yet? As far as what? Field, like, you know, the a, a high jumper, a pole vault, a long jumper, that type of stuff. Oh, I don't – that's tricky. I don't know if the Hall of Fame is uh, can equip to that. That's a trickier one. I, I think those three I just mentioned are the next three that will probably be in consideration and should be in within the next decade for the track program. Uh, I think just the way it is. They were part of that successful run. Carl Smith Gilbert, yep, head coach. That was, that was who I was going to mention next. I think should get consideration. She was the, the head coach. Uh, now at Georgia. In fact, I have a quote from her about Afia Charles Wilson that we'll hopefully will run this week on Black and Gold Banneret. But she should get consideration when her career is done because what she put UCF track and field on the map nationally. All right. Uh, let's go ahead and just quickly, ad uh, quickly address a coach that you very much highly touted, uh, Linda Gooch. Will be in. Should be in. My philosophy is she should wait. They should wait till she gets in, uh, retires 
but I could see her getting in in the next few years. By the way, Renee Gillespie for softball now at Iowa should be in down the road. We didn't mention that. We haven't talked coaches in the other sports. Cromwell should be in. Gillespie should be in. Talk Cromwell. I, yeah, we talked Cromwell. Kurt uh, Spiral, men's basketball, I think should get in down the road. Uh, once his career is done at Iowa as an assistant. Um, and I think from a current standpoint. Oh, no, oh we're going to get to her. I don't know who you're going to say. We're going to get to him. I have him right, on the list. Don't worry. We'll right, get go to him. All right, go, uh, go. I just forgot to mention from track and field, Renaya Jones. I mean, she's off to a, hell, a great start, isn't she? I mean, if she continues this track, no question she'll be in. All right. Uh, our, all right. He, uh, now, women's, bas- women's basketball. I got two names for you here. Go. Uh, they're not eligible yet. K.K. Wright. Yes. Probably, arguably the best basketball player in women's basketball in the program history. Uh, I ranked her in my top 20. Yes, she should get it. All right. Zakira Lewis. Zai, I don't know if she gets in. I don't know if she gets in. She had a really good career, but I'm thinking – you know, there's some players like Aisha Patrick. There's players like uh, Chelsea Wiley who are not in yet. I think they get in before Zai. I, the only one I feel the most comfortable with is KK. All right. Uh, we're going to – all right, we're going to do volleyball and then one more right. athlete, and then one more name that Good. I think would be very interesting to discuss really quickly. So Good. here we go, volleyball. We have, a, we have plenty of them here. Uh, first off, from times gone by in the 90s, Miriam Metzkes and Emily Overlook, Stoker. most over overlooked athlete. I don't understand how she's not in. She's in the like, she was at the McKenna Melville of the nineties. I don't understand how she's been overlooked. They were part of a successful run. Probably the most, the biggest uh, snub I would argue of any UCF athlete, unless I'm not aware of something behind the scenes. You know, whatever. Absolutely. So here, here's it. Here's interesting: is Metzis and Kiesler are both the top two in service aces in UCF history, and they're also the top two in sets played. So they've also played for a very long time, yeah. As well, so you and you this and what you said earlier applied to both of them, right? Which is the other one? Uh, there was Metzis and Ke- uh, Kieser, uh Emily Kieser. I would like I I ed, I give the edge to Metzkes a little bit, but the other one should get consideration as well. But Metzkes definitely should be in at some. She's been overlooked. She's been a snub. All right, uh, this woman will become eligible in a few in a few years. She left in 2018. She leads all, major lead in digs all time. Jordan Pingle. Yes, best libero in the history of the program should be in. Yes. All right, now we're at the still active ones. I think the two obvious ones from this year's team, as far as players go. McKenna Melville and Amory Watson. Both should be in. Melville is a lock. I think Watson will join her. They both have had a lot of team success. So I think they will get in. I think I would not surprise, I would not be surprised though if Melville gets in before her, but who knows? I think they both should definitely strongly get in. I'm going to throw another name from the past, by the way. Delena Sardin, part of the 2014 championship team. I think she will be the next volleyball player to get inducted into the Hall of Fame. I think she's coming up here in the next year or two. So I think she gets in. Uh, Delena Sardin. Here's another name that I found on the list that, that I'd like to ask you real quick. Meredith Murphy. She's she's second in digs. Yeah, her. second best libero. I, it's hard for a libero to get in. I think the la, you know, I think she gets consideration, but uh, I think Sardin's going to be the next af- volleyball player to get in. I haven't even mentioned Aaron Campbell, who should get consideration to get into the Hall of Fame. She played in the 07, uh, 09 range, I believe. Uh, Mets guess we've mentioned, who's top five in kills and digs. Uh, there's a lot of volleyball players that's probably been overlooked. So I, for the reason I bring that up, it might be tough for someone like Murphy to stand out, especially when someone like Pingle, who's been an All-American. All-Americans, if you've been an All-American, you have an edge over a non-All-American. I would say this. Honestly, I think the Hall of Fame is going to be seeing a lot of a lot of track, a, a good amount of track and field athletes and volleyball players. Which makes – well, I mean, well, in theory, but there's a lot of competition because they're going up against softball. You're going up against men's basketball. You're going up against uh, – there's a lot of sports that you're going up against. And, again, usually in these Hall of Fame classes when there's five members, two of them usually in a minimum are football players. I'm not a fan of that. I would personally keep it at one per sport. So you can give more sports opportunities, but I don't see that happening because football is what drives revenue. Football is the popular sport. And if you look at this year's class, it's sold out because probably of Blake Bortles and Josh Sitt in, in, to, in, to a large degree and Jermaine, I think, to, to an extent as well. All right. 
So the reason why this is the um this is the only coach besides Carol Smith Gilbert that I put on the list is because he's one of the longest serving UCF athletics head coaches out there, Todd Dagenet. Yeah, I think he'll get in at some point. Uh, I think he's definitely from the current coaches. Him, I think Scott Calabrese, the track he's going, uh, will certainly get consideration to get in. And uh, I think Tiffany Roberts, a Haydack, has a shot to get in. So I think we we're currently in a run of coaches here that have a chance to join down the road. Yeah, the reason why I didn't really put them on the list was because I felt like they haven't been around long enough for fair, fair. Long, long enough, in my opinion. For example, Scott Frost, if we just considered his season, he would be in. But because he was only around for maybe a couple of them, I, w- I don't think he will. But um, I, so length is part of the reason why I feel like that we need to see long a, a little longer tenures from them before we officially get them in. But with their success they have now, for sure, I would say so based on the success they have now, they would definitely be in. Uh, All right, so here we go. One last name. Now, one last name. We've seen, you know, using university presidents get in. So, and there is a way for, you know, executives and stuff to get in to the UCF Athletics Hall of Fame. And considering the impact that he had on this, on this university, on this program, on this brand, I have to add, we, I think we have to discuss a little bit on the possibility that Danny White could possibly get in. Yeah, administrator, I mean, AD, yeah, he'll probably get in down the road. Absolutely. I, I agree with that. All right. Uh, is all right. Any other names from any sport that you would that you think you could get in? That I have, we have well, I think this exercise we just went through tells you how hard this job is for the committee, right? Like, maybe I'm glad I'm not part of it. I'm probably glad because imagine picking out five people from this list. Well, I mean, I had a fun time making this list, and I could just you just go through yeah. it every every year, and you find and yeah. you find and you find ones that really work as far as. Uh, the time that the time that you have, I mean, obviously you have to wait for some people, some of them to retire still, but there's still, pl- uh, uh, I was surprised of how many athletes from times gone by from the eighties and the nineties that didn't. And even the early two thousands, considering that's considered 20 years ago now. That, and again, it's not, it's, I don't think it, I don't think anybody did it on purpose. Uh, it's just things, you know, things get lost, you know, 20 years from now, Bryce, and nobody will, people forget about me. So, you know, it's like, oh, whatever. Who called softball? I don't remember that. You know, it happens. Um, so we'll see. We'll see. I think they'll tweak this as time goes on, and that will obviously help others, I think. Hopefully, I think the main thing is they can do this in an annual standpoint, yearly standpoint, and um, maybe add a, a category for, like, some of the – I don't know what the – how would you name it? Seniors or the veterans, like, the 80s, 90s era. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know, however you want to name it, title it. That could be kind of like what baseball did with the the senior league, you know, the seniors, if you will. I don't know, whatever you want to call it. So here's now here's an interesting thing I just I just thought of because John Hitt is in the is in the UCF Athletics Hall of Fame, and obviously there's still length a uh, length of tenure to be considered with this. So it's so obviously it's something we're still kind of going to have to see. But do you think if things go well, do you think that Alexander Cartwright could possibly get in there because of he get, getting us into the Big Twelve? Well, he 12? helped us get to the Big Twelve. That's going to help. And uh, there has been presidents for uh, there's been presidents that are in been in voted into the Hall of Fame. So yes, I think those are all in play. Yes, all right. I also think by the way. Mark Daniels, the longtime voice of UCF, should be in uh, whenever his career is done as probably the first broadcaster to be uh, inducted. If not, if not Jerry O'Neill, definitely Mark. Speaking of broadcasters, do you think that the voice of the bounce house, Eric Kohler, could possibly be there? He was the uh, that I don't know. I don't know about how that stuff. I just think Mark stands out because he's been the voice in football with radio for a long time. I don't know how committees look at far as PA guys and things like that. But I'm just throwing out Mark as one because radio guys have been inducted in pre- other schools. Uh, and that, well, but and that you case, know. talking about executive executives, I don't know if you want to go to go down to assistant executives, but I mean, if assistant executives are involved, I feel like Eric DeSalvo could possibly be someone. Wow. To think about. Wow. I mean, if you want to think about it, think about inducting assistants. That's uh, I don't know. That's uh, maybe I don't know. I don't know how that works. That's a little. I like to focus on the athletes and coaches. I no, that's fair, control. and I did too. I, I, there's a reason why I held, why I only had Dajne and Smith. Gilbert but I, to your defense, like an Art Zelenek has been inducted to the Hall of Fame and things like that. So administrators have been inducted before. So I just don't know the criteria for that. So it's a little harder for me. But no, yeah, that's why I brought it up last because I think it's something that really drives yeah. because it's something that I think drives the most the most discussion. And, and I think that 
honestly, the fact that, again, that this list was so long and it, it's on, hard. And, and I tell you, it is only before the show that we wanted to kind of wrap this up at around seven. It's about a half. It's about yeah. 40 minutes after that. And I think the fact that we went this long with all of with, with this list is really speaks to the, the not only how not, not only the the amazing athletes that UCF athletics has now. And just recent, and just recently, you know, um, recently lost, move on from, and move, you know, uh, some athletes moving on to bigger and better things, but also plenty of athletes, for a, a good number of athletes from those days in the eighties and ninety and nineties that you said, like you said, that, that we've said over and over, were pretty overlooked. Yeah, I think this was a good exercise and a good show and what I wanted to do. There are some athletes well-deserved that maybe have been overlooked. This happens in every sport, by the way. It's not just a CCF thing. This happens in NBA, baseball, football. It is, it's tough. And I think the committee has a hard job because there's so – and it's a good problem to have. There's so many worthy athletes that it's hard to just put them all in. You know what I mean? It, I think from the outside we think it's so easy, but it's not. And I think this show has shown how hard it is with all the names that you brought up. I mean, you did the research. There's probably names we haven't even mentioned that probably also should get consideration, but we don't, we don't, we've run out of time for that. But uh, I want to, you know, salute the committees that they've done a hard, they've done a hard job and a good job. This is a great class. This is this one, the last two hall of fame classes, Bryce, and this one, and then 2019, that was obviously had George O'Leary, Kevin Smith, Brandon Marshall, Alini Reyes, Allison Kime, and Drew Butera. I would argue these two last classes are the two best classes of all time. That tells you how tough this is because we're seeing the best. I mean, we're talking about the best of the best. And, uh, man, it's a hard job. So salute to everybody that takes the time to be involved and make this happen. Oh, yeah. I mean, hey, considering how many athletes that we just named, we could probably see, you know, the best – the best UCF class uh, every every year for at least a couple of years. And that's why I'm saying, like, some of the ones we've talked about that have been overlooked perhaps may not get in because the competition is that tough. Uh, we'll see what happens. Um, hopefully this show helps. Uh, I hope people take well, the pilot, right? You know, I'll, I'll, say that, I'll say this. If they want to be able to keep the diversity of sports, I think considering the low, the low baseball is in, we mentioned Vince Zawaski. I mean, if they want to be able to – if, considering baseball that has a little bit of a lack of names in that direction, that could be a, an advantage for Zawaski. It's hard. Again, we don't know all the 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 new ounces of it. I mean, heck, uh, we haven't even brought up the Jake Bergman factor. Jake Bergman's not in because of what how his career ended off the field, uh, and that has to be in play too, Bryson. And and that's the thing we don't know is like some of the athletes from the past. Was there an off the field situation, whether it's academic or whatever, that maybe kept them out? That we don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Oh yeah, that's one of the reasons I avoided mentioned Ryan Schneider, even though statistically, even correct because his though career, the way his career, be, right? It's statistically, yeah. I think he should be in. Right, but I knew, but you know, we, we've talked about, we've mentioned, t talked about this together before off camera about about the R Ryan Schneider situation and how, and so knowing that, I that that's why I held off. Yeah, academically off. kicked out, not a great ending to his career. Thankfully, he is doing great now as a high school coach and he's involved with UCF. But you're right that those things factor in. So we'll see. Um, it's a great. This was fun, though. This was fun. Yeah. Hopefully people got educated on this. I certainly did. You gave me some names I didn't even think about. So props to you. You you uh, you did your work good, sir. Hey, you gave me a few names I didn't think about either. So I think it was a good give and take. Hopefully everybody enjoyed this. Uh, I know it's a little long, but I, I really do. I love the Hall of Fame concept. I'm glad UCF's pushing hard for this. Hopefully this is an annual thing. It'll be uh, this Friday. Congrats to the current class. Blake Bortles, Josh Sitton, Natalie Lane, Afia Charles, and Jermaine Taylor, all worthy of getting in. Uh, and certainly, uh, man, everybody that bought, they're going to be at that event. It's going to be tremendous. They're going to be honored during the football game against East Carolina. Whenever that happens, and if you're at the game, make sure you stand up and give them an ovation because they've all, at the end of the day, they've uh, their contributions to UCF uh is enormous to all the, not only Joe sports, but just as a UCF alum in, in general. So I, congrats I, still to them. Remember, I still remember when they honored the first 1979 football team in the, in the state yeah. back in 2019. That's a great point. I love those type of things. Uh, anniversaries, themes, Bryson, as you get to know me, I, I'm a big fan of that stuff. So uh, there, all right, that's going to do it for here. You and I have to have dinner uh, uh, separately and uh, got to get ready. We're going to have a podcast later this week. Jeff, I would assume would join us for that. We'll have a podcast. We'll go over all the current UCF sports. We might talk some Hall of Fame stuff, too, there on that episode. Blackandgoldbanneret.com. Make sure you're there for the latest in UCF. Uh, 
YouTube. Make sure you subscribe to our YouTube page. Make sure you like us. We have the interviews up right now with Natalie Lane and a few of Charles Wilson. I hope to have two articles up this week on those two particulars. Uh, we'll see. Uh, but definitely the interview, the entire interview will be on our YouTube page as well. Last thoughts, Bryce. Uh, I would say considering how long this show is, I would say we should maybe put some links in the descriptions below of, of time codes, because if you, oh. you have, if you have certain, if you have, if, if you ha- have a, uh, affection for a certain UCF sport, then you'll be able to go to that time in the video. All right, I'll work on that. I'll Time's work on, on that. Time's right. gone by, but beyond that, I had a lot of fun. I was really, um, when you asked me to, you know, when you talked about what you were doing with the uh, hall of fame, uh, Hall of Fame w- articles, whether it was with the interviews or this show, uh, I wanted to really be involved in this whenever I can, uh, whenever I can, because I love sports history as well, especially in the case of this university that I re- that I love very much, and I love covering with you all. And so it was really great to be able to kind of walk through um, for you is memory lane, and for me the history books to really to really uh, uncover a few names some people might not have realized, and be able to give just dues to those. That that rightly deserve to be included for this high for this highly uh, for this uh, great honor to be in the UCF Athletics Hall of Fame, be one of the best of the best at in Orlando's hometown university. No doubt, and hopefully some of the fans learn some names and learn their history of this great program. There've been a lot of great athletes uh, over the years, and uh, man, that's what makes it so much fun. So, Bryson, great work. Appreciate this. This was a lot. This was a blast. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was great. It was great talking with you. That is Bryson Turner. I'm Eric Lopez. Make sure, again, you subscribe to our YouTube page and like us there as well as follow us at the YouTube page. Make sure you also follow us on Twitter. There, there's our home place, break, folks, for all the latest at UCF. We'll tweet it out. It's UCF underscore Banneret. Check out blackandgoldbanneret.com. You'll check out Bryson's nightcap every week. Uh, he did a feature on Amory Watson. Look for, for more features on UCF athletes down the road. Uh, and we'll have obviously football, we'll get you, uh, stuff. Basketball's about to start, so it's a busy, busy time at UCF. So, for Bryson Turner, I'm Eric Lopez. We hope you've enjoyed this edition of Night Shift. Good night and charge on. Night, Night Nation.